Reformed Church. But then in verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So he's talking about the marriage of these two, two things. Jesus had to provide it, and people have to believe it. Jesus had to provide it, people have to believe it. Those two things equal us, in this particular case, receiving righteousness. But he says in verse 26, why is it that Jesus provided it, and then we have to believe it? If you think about it, right, for an almighty God, right, which he is, for an almighty God who has all authority, you know, king of the universe, why does he have to send his son to be bruised and battered, the son that he loves, to get something done? People don't think about this, okay? Think about it for a second. Don't just say God's all-powerful, you're wrong. Think about it for a second. Why does an almighty God have to go through so much pain to do something for us? Just marinate on that for a second. Because if, if he could have done it an easier way, we're basically saying that he devalues his son, because who in their right mind would sacrifice the son that they love, that they actually love, to so much pain if there was an easier way to do it? Jesus even prayed, essentially that in a paraphrase, that if there's any other way that this cup can pass for me, let's do it that way, but not my will but yours be done. And, of course, the answer was the cross, which is evident there wasn't an easier way to do it. So why, in all of God's power and authority, does he have to go through such a painful road to communicate something to us? Um, just right there, it starts dissolving this notion that, well, God can just do anything at all. Because if God can just do anything at all, again, it, it, it begs the question, why do it such a painful way? And on top of that, why require that people believe it before they can receive? Right? Um, and anyone that just tells you, well, God is almighty and his plan is mysterious and we don't know, or his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, just so you know, anyone that says that, it's impossible to have a conversation with someone like that because they're basically saying, it cannot be understood. Okay, so um, we need something better than that than just God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. The Bible says that we can know the deep things of God now because we have the spirit that's from God. Okay, that, that's, that's a cop-out to just kind of say it's a, it's a mystery. The Bible says that he's made known the mystery that was hidden in ages past. Okay, so we live in an age in which the mystery is being made known, not where we have the right to just say, well, I don't know. I don't know why he did it that way. It's just God. Even in our praise and worship songs, People, people sing to God about, I'll never know, you know, this or that. And, and it's like, no, you can know. So why did God take such a painful route um, if he can just do anything? And let me say this, and just stay with me on this for those that have never heard this before. God can't just do anything. And you know that actually already. Even if you think you disagree with that at first, you actually already know that, that God can't just do anything. And at the very least, just doesn't do anything. Because if I asked you if God is just, you would say yes. I would say, is God unjust? You would say no. So you just put a negative to God. You said he's not something. Okay? You hear me on this? You just said he's not something. Because we, we, we acknowledge he's all-powerful. He has all authority. That, that's great. That's all true. But we almost don't want to say that God isn't something until I ask you, is he, is he ever unjust? You would say, no, he's never unjust. You know? The Bible even says, is there, un, is there unrighteous with God? With God? You know, far be it. There is no unrighteousness with God. So we already know, really, as believers, that there are things that God is not. Okay? Now, I can bring you through verses right now to show you that it's actually impossible, an inability of God to do injustice. But let's actually just leave that to the side for right now. Because I could bring you through verses that would actually show you that. Um, that it's actually, it's more than just God chooses not to be unjust, but that he can't be unjust. But, but that aside, let's just go with what believers already know. Believers may not think that God can't be unjust, but they at least know that he won't be unjust. At least. Every Christian pretty much knows, God, if I ask you, will God ever be unjust, seeing as he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, you would say, no, he'll never be unjust. Okay, so that's a fact we can count on that forever, forever past, forever future, there is no injustice ever seen in God and never will be. Okay, 
that limits one severely. God is limited. That's another term we don't want to say. And yet you just said that by acknowledging that he's never unjust. That is a limitation. So God doesn't just do justice and injustice. He only does the justice. So that means there are things he doesn't do. Now, I would argue he can't do, but that's a sight. Because the Bible said there are things that he's not able to do, like lie. When the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie, that word actually means not able. And in, in there are other verses as well that, that describe inabilities of God to do those bad characteristics or to sin. But at the very least, as I said before, I'll put that to the side for the sake of argument right now, and let's just go with what Christians typically believe, that he will never be unjust. Um, you just said God is limited. To what? To justice. Is he limited in power? No, we know that. You and I both know he's not limited in power. You and I both know he's not limited in authority. He's God. He created everything. How could he be limited in authority over something he created? But you believe he's limited. Now, you don't term it that way. I'm terming it that way for you. You would term it as he's never unjust. God is love, which means what? He's never hate, right? So there are things he's not, which means he's limited to what? In the realm of love and justice. Now, granted, no, none of us are limiting him. He limits himself, right? He limits himself to those characteristics. But it's still a limitation. If you tell me God will only ever act in the realm of justice, that means also, by process of elimination, we can deduce that he will never act in the realm of injustice, which means he's limited in the ways he will act. I would argue he's limited in the way that he can act, but that's fine. He's limited in the way that he ever will act. That's your answer right there as to why God sent Jesus and went through such a painful route, because he's limited. He's limited. God, your God, is limited. Now, he limits himself. He limits himself, because God may be all-powerful and all-knowing and have all authority, but he's not all characteristics, which every Christian already intuitively knows just by reading Scripture. He'll never lie. He's not a man that he should lie. God is only love. There's no unrighteousness with God, which means he's limited to the realm of those things that are good and right, holy and just and good, and never in the realm of those things that are wrong or sinful, right? So if you were to kind of have, if I had my dry erase board, I would do it, but I want to take the time right now. But if you had a sort of, you know, you ever seen like a color wheel? I work on a computer a lot, so I work with like a color wheel a lot. You can see the whole spectrum of all the colors on there. If that were the spectrum of all characteristics, God doesn't have all of them. He's limited. Let's just divide it in half. The just side, right? He's never unjust. Now, when it comes to power, he's got all the colors. The full spectrum of power. Authority, full spectrum of authority. God isn't limited by his lack of authority. He's limited by his lack of characteristics. God is only just. Okay? God is only just, will never be unjust. Again, I would argue can never be unjust. So with all that said, so now let's, let's lay out the dilemma of the world right now, okay? To answer, this, this will absolutely answer your question, all the very tough questions supposedly, I say that sort of sarcastically, that Christians say they can't answer as to why does God allow this, why does God allow that, all will be answered right now. All will be answered right now. Okay? Um, but let's just lay out the, the sort of scenario of the world right now. We know that Adam sinned. Um, through sin came death into the world. Death is all that decay and corruption, all that stuff that you see in the world. Um, it resulted in sickness and, you know, in, in aging and weakness and all, all that stuff, right? All, all that's just categorized in the lump of stuff that came through Adam. And you can read Romans 5 to hear kind of all about that process. So sin is obviously the, the bad moral evil that Adam did, and then passed on to generations after him. And along with that sin came Adam's curse, which is death, and that's all the suffering and stuff, okay? All the suffering in the world, the Bible classifies that as, all, as, as death, okay? So God is a God. We actually have a very good God, very good God. His intentions toward us, the Bible speaks about, right, how his mercy endures forever. Um, we have a very merciful God, okay? So let's start with that. You got merciful God and you got sin and death in the world, all right? Let's just say suffering for right now in the world. you got a lot of suffering in the world, but a merciful God. Okay, so merciful God, he's all-powerful, he has all authority, and therefore, when we only tell people that, people are wondering, 
If he's so merciful and he's got all power and authority, why don't you just fix it? Just do it. Snap your fingers. Do something. You see, this is where we're missing it, though. What does a merciful God do when he's got all power to share with you, all authority with which to do it, but he's got to be just? That's the part we don't get as the church. The limiting factor of your God is his justice. Now, just so you know, that's not a fault of his. <laughs> that's a good thing. I wish everyone were limited to justice. Okay? That, that's not a fault of God's, all right? We were the ones at fault. We, we got ourselves into this mess of sin and death and all this stuff, right? So it's no fault of God's, but what does a merciful God do when there's suffering all through the world because of sin? And all that, we're all born into sin. All of us are born to sin through Adam. We came from Adam. Adam corrupted his nature and, and became sinful, and it passed on to every generation after him. There are different theories on that, but that doesn't matter. Everyone will acknowledge that all are under sin. The Bible says that right in Romans. All are under sin. I think we actually just read that. All are under sin, apart from the Lord. So what does a merciful God do when he really wants to fix suffering in the world? He wants to do that, all right? He sees people suffering and dying. He sees wars. He sees hurt. Um, he wants to fix all that. But... The Bible also, here's a principle of justice that I'm not making up. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's a principle of justice that I didn't say. God says that, right? So I'm not assuming something about God's justice. He said that himself. That means that what's just for sin is death. So if that's the just thing to do, and God is just, you would think, well, he kind of has to leave it that way then, right? He's just. Well, why does God have to leave sin and death that way if he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing and he has all authority? Well, because he's just. He's got to act in the realm of justice. It's not right. It's not right for God to just take suffering away when people are in sin because that's actually the payment for sin is death. And people were stuck in that. So what does God do? God has to work, watch this, within the confines of justice to get things done. He is not able to do everything. You said it yourself by saying he's not unjust. God cannot just do anything. He stays within those just, righteous characteristics. And that's why God says this to himself, of course. It's not like he happened upon this idea, but for the sake of story. This is why God says to himself, okay, but what if I send my son, who is just, and therefore is full of life, because life comes through righteousness, according to Romans 8. Life comes through righteousness, death comes through sin. So what if I take my son, and he takes their sin upon himself, and the suffering on himself, so that I can say, I have fulfilled the suffering. It's actually been fulfilled, justly. And he became their sin, so I can actually take away their sin and make them righteous now. The just for the unjust. Why did God have to go through such a painful route if he's all-powerful, all-knowing? Because God can't do everything, or at least, to most Christians, won't do everything. He has to stay within the realm of justice, and it just so happens that the only just way for God to take your sin away and your suffering away is through Jesus. Someone had to take it. Someone had to fulfill it. Someone had to take it upon themselves. He can't just push it under the rug. It has to be finished, right? That word should ring a bell. It has to be finished. When sin is finished, it brings forth death, according to James chapter 1. And so Jesus took sin so he could run the whole cycle of what came through Adam in his own body all the way up until he breathed his last, and it was finished. He let the whole cycle, God allowed all of us to die for our sins in the body of his son. We all died. That's actually biblical terminology. The Bible says that if one died for all, then all died. That means that we actually already, all of us already suffered. We already died. We suffered and died for our sin already. Every one of us. That leaves us free now because that happened in the body of Jesus. But you see, that's why God had to go through such a painful route to get righteousness to you, to get life to you, is because... He's working within the realm of justice, and Jesus is the only just way for people to receive. So why is there still suffering in this world? Because as we just read, 
not only is the only just way for God to communicate things to people through Jesus. Remember, he's working in the realm of justice. That's what he's got. That's all he's got to work with is justice. And Jesus is that just way for him to communicate things to us. But also, it says in verse uh, uh, 26, remember, this is particularly talking about righteousness. The principle applies to anything. But it says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. Watch this. When it says to declare at this present time, at, or at this time, his righteousness, he's basically saying with that, uh, this is how I provided righteousness. At this present time, this is how I, how I provided the righteousness. Because he had been imputing righteousness to people for a long time in the Old Testament. And he says here, to declare at the present time, this is how I make people righteous. Verse 25, go to verse 25 real quick. Notice what he had said before, that he set forth Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You see those two things? He set Jesus as a propitiation, but also necessary is faith in his blood. Why did he choose this route? Verse 26, that he might be just. That Jesus might be, or that the Father might be just in the way that he's doing things. And now he can justify us who believe in Jesus. It's the only just way to do it. So when people ask, why is there still suffering in the world? There's only one way to receive. There's only one way to receive. And that is through putting faith in Jesus. People ask, well, why couldn't God just snap his fingers? Because that he might be just. It's, this is, we're not talking about Christians think, well, no, I know we receive through faith in Jesus, but if God really wanted, he could just snap his fingers and do it. No, no, no. He, I would argue, of course, he can't. You might argue he won't, but it doesn't matter. He will never be unjust, which then confines him to justice, which confines him to not just snapping his fingers. Can't just snap his fingers. As long as God is going to stay within the realm of justice, he can't just snap his fingers and make people's problems go away. Cannot just snap his fingers and make your problems go away if he wants to be just. Why? Because Romans 3 says the only just way that he might, for instance, justify people, communicate his righteousness to people, is through what? Through Jesus' propitiation, through faith in his blood. If those two things are not present, people can't be made righteous. They can't receive. And why can't God? We kind of have to come to a point now as believers, even with everything we've just said, why is it that we have to come together as believers now and acknowledge God can't, can't, just snap his fingers and heal somebody. Snap his fingers and make someone righteous. Why? Because he'll never be unjust. And that would be outside the realm of justice to snap his fingers and do that. Well, how do you know, Pastor Mike, that that's outside the realm of justice? Who are you, Pastor Mike, to say that that's outside the realm of justice? God can do anything. He can just snap his fingers. That verse says it's outside the realm of justice. It says... The reason why God only makes people righteous when they believe in Jesus is so that he can stay just. Are we seeing this? Well, Pastor Mike, but he's all-powerful. It's, it's not a limitation on his power. It's a limitation on his characteristics. But he has authority over everything. No, no, but it's a limitation on his characteristics. It's a limitation in justice. So, you can't say both things. That, so we, we already know from verse 26, there's only one just way that God can make people righteous. Let's just stick with the making people righteous thing for a second because that's what this is talking about. We know there's only one just way to make people righteous. He says through Jesus' propitiation, through faith in that propitiation. That's the only just way. Now, there might be a lot of ways to do it if someone weren't just, but as far as justice is concerned, that's the only way to do it. So you can't simultaneously say these two things. You can't say God is always just, will always be just, he'll never be, uh, uh, he'll never be unjust. You can't maintain that and then say, well, God could snap his fingers and just make people righteous. Well, that's unjust, according to that verse. So you can't say both at the same time. You see what I'm saying? People don't realize the limitations of God. And again, I know we don't like that word, the limitations of God, but you just said, of course, I'm talking to the imaginary person with me, that God would never be unjust. And that is a limitation. He's not working in that realm. He's confined to this other realm over here. Um, but this is why I'm saying you can't say both things at the same time. 
You can't say God is just and will always be just and say, well, he could just snap his fingers. He could just do whatever he wanted. Can he? That would, he, could he just snap his fingers and take away sin and death that people are rightfully owed? That's the payment for sin. So can he just snap his fingers and say, well, actually, I know I said this was the payment for your sin, but actually, um, no. I'll just, uh, I'll just remove the death, even though it's just for you to suffer death if you sin. Again, it, it, it just th th those two things are oil and water. You just can't say both at the same time. Now, if, you're, if you maintained that God, he can be unjust. Some, sometimes God is unjust. Sometimes he's just. He's, he's here and there. Sometimes God does the wrong thing. Sometimes he does the right thing. Well, then sure, then you could, you could say he does anything, right? You could pull something out of a hat and say God just might do anything. You never know. But you can't have that mentality about God just might do anything you never know when you already know he's always going to do the right thing, the just thing. Um, and again, we, we, don't, we just don't feel that we serve a limited God. But we do. We serve a limited God. In the realm of his characteristics alone. He's just, he'll never be unjust. He's love, he'll never be hate. He's limited in his characteristics. The Bible says that, for instance, God is faithful. That's another thing that he'll never not be. God is faithful, and it says, uh, even if we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That's a limitation. God, for it to be impossible for God to deny himself, deny or stop being faithful, that's a limitation. But what is that also? That's a characteristic. That's a characteristic. God is limited in his characteristics. Um, and so what that solves for a lot of people is this. I've explained this a, a, a while ago. But um, the, the example I gave a while ago was that if if a father had a daughter that was sick and dying of some sickness, and, and then the, the daughter died of the sickness, and everybody knew the father had the antidote, he was perfectly able to save his daughter and didn't. We'd all frown upon that, right? Why do we frown? Why do we think so ill of that? Well, because he could have done something and he didn't. Right? He didn't exhaust all the possibilities. He could have done something and didn't. He knew that he could have done something and he didn't. But who in reality blames a father if his daughter dies of something? He's bringing her to the hospital. He's doing all these things. And of course, I'm talking in a realm of like, this is an example of the Lord. I'm talking of an example outside the Lord, right? You would never blame the father if he's doing everything he can to get his daughter better. And if the daughter dies... The daughter may have died, but you don't look at the father and say, well, it's your fault. No, you, he exhausted all the possibilities on his end, right? You, 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 the reason why you don't think ill of that father is because you know he was limited, right? It's his limitations that makes you think better of him. Because if someone dies when you're unlimited, that's on, that, that's on you, right? We can all agree with that. Um, but if someone dies and you were limited, well, you did what you could, and, and that, that little girl died, and you know what? Uh, I understand, and I don't blame you. You actually might even attribute that father still being a very loving father, even though his daughter died. Why? If he's limited. If he was unlimited, you wouldn't attribute love. He could have done something and didn't. But if he's limited, you might even attribute love that he did everything he could on his end. Watch this. He did everything he could on his end. But because of his limitations, you don't blame him for the death of somebody else like that, right? And here's where we come to it, okay? The thought that God is unlimited has tarnished his reputation today. Right there. The idea that God can do anything at any time the unlimited idea of God, which the Bible does not teach, does not teach. You'll point at, to verses to me, uh, as many people have, you'll point to verses about all his authority. I don't disagree with that. You'll point to verses about all his power. I don't disagree with that. But you're not going to find a verse that says he's all characteristics. You won't find that. You'll find God continually explaining his limitations. I'm not a man. I will not lie. 
It's impossible for me to lie. I'm faithful even when you're faithless. I can't even deny myself. You're going to find that all over the Bible. Tons of, of examples of God stating the characteristics that he is and also the characteristics he's not. And it is knowing that, which is why at this church we don't blame God for the daughter dying. Because we know he did everything he could on his end. But until you come to that conclusion, it's going to be that nagging thing in the back of your mind, why didn't he do something? He did everything he could on his end. And even today, continues to try through this church even right now, to communicate the message of the gospel, to let people know what the father already did for his daughter on his end. The daughter has to believe it to connect with that provision, though. But the father on his end has done everything he can do. How do I know that? Because he's only just, and this verse says that he already took his only just route to communicate his provision to you. And that is the propitiation of his son, and now he's calling you to believe it. That's it. There's no snapping fingers on this side or waving his hand on that side. There's no other way. That's why even the Bible, if you actually put all this together, Jesus died on the cross. And when he died, the father tore the veil, testifying about his son that he's the only way into my glory. We'll call it that for now. Okay? And then on either side of Jesus was a thief and a robber. Do you know why? Because it is a depiction of John 10 in which Jesus is, is called the door. And it says that if you try to climb up into the glory of God, into the inheritance of God some other way, you're going to be robbed. Why? Because they're dead ends. There's only one just way. Why? Because God just simply chose that way and he could have done it three other ways? No. No because there was no other way to let that cup pass from his son. If we want to save them, that is, at least. Because God didn't have to do it. But being as he is merciful, if he wants to maintain that, which he always will, he loved us and did everything, everything he possibly could on his end by fulfilling all sin and all death in the body of his son so that we might be dead to sin and live to righteousness, so that you could be made the righteousness of God, so that you could be free from the suffering that he bore on himself. But that's it. Now he's done. He's exhausted every single resource, and by resource I mean that one. You don't, I'm going to come back to this again, you don't blame someone for the death of somebody else when they were limited in what they could do. And God, whether we want to term it that way or not, is limited in what he can do, because he's only just, and by our own admission as believers, he is never unjust, which limits him to that realm. I hope that everyone is seeing that. Um, the, 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 we, we don't, I don't think we see the repercussions of what we say when, when, when Christians, so I'm not blaming Christians as if they do it intentionally. They see verses about God being all-powerful and all-knowing and stuff, and they're like, well, God can do anything. Well, th th no, <laughs> no. No, he can't just do anything. Why? Because of his characteristics. And, and they, don't, they don't hone in on that. But, but the thing is, Christians don't realize the repercussions of what they're saying when they say, oh, God could just, he could just do anything. He's God. Um, they don't realize that it's like with that father and daughter example. When the daughter is sick and dying, you might be saying it as a praise to the father. You can do anything. You're almighty. You, you can do anything you want but that doesn't reflect real well on him when someone's dying then on his watch and he can, quote, unquote, do anything. You see what I'm saying? We say this in our praise and worship songs, like, Lord, you can just do anything as a compliment to God. And I'm not saying, so I'm not saying we do it maliciously, but your compliment that is erroneous, it's, 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 it's incorrect, um, it reflects very poorly on God when a Christian goes through something or gets in a car accident and now you come to church the next service and say, God, you can do anything? That doesn't sit the same way anymore. Because now that car accident comes to mind and think, hmm, what happened there, God? It is the unlimited potential of God that we believe, which is not correct. The unlimited potential of God that reflects poorly on him, and that is why his name is blasphemed today, is because of that wrong doctrine. He is not unlimited. He only has certain characteristics. 
And again, we could go on for hours talking about, of course, uh, well, he could if he wanted to. Suffice to say for right now, despite the fact that I don't believe it this way, all Christians know he'll never be unjust. Never. Which limits what he can do, therefore. We all know that. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, but how does it reflect on God when you tell somebody, you know what, God didn't want that Christian to get into that car accident. In fact, God did everything he could on his end to prevent it, but also, good news, to fix it, even if it happens. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the life to sustain you if you're living, but he's also the plan B. He's the resurrection to raise you if you die. Resurrection is just a plan B, but you know what? Everything's been fixed, everything's been provided, but he does want you to, to learn that. Well, why do I have to? Well, why do I have to? Well, why do I have to? Why did he have to do it this way? Why do I have to believe? Why didn't he just do something? That he might be just. That he might be just. We forget that. We really do forget that. Um, I'll close in prayer right now. I'll close in prayer right now. But it's su such important stuff to understand. Such important stuff to understand. Thank you so much, Jesus, for doing everything that you could in justice to save us. And thank you so much, Father, for drawing people to this knowledge, to this gospel. Why else would we be preaching right now if there was another way to do it? <laughs> All of our preaching, Father, is in vain if there's an easier way to do this. <laughs> it's all in vain, Lord. Faith is made void. The gospel is made of no effect. There's no sense in people believing you, Father. There's no sense in us preaching so that people can believe if this all can be done another way. For that matter, even more egregious, Father, there would be no point in Jesus suffering so much if there was another way to let his cup pass. But I thank you, Father, that you knew exactly what you were doing. And the only just way to take these things from us was to, be, was to lay it on your, your beloved son so that you could be judge over all and Jesus could be the sacrifice. And between father and son, I thank you so much, Lord, that you, you fixed all this stuff. And as a church now, not just this church, but as a church, Lord, Father, I pray that we would gather together to learn that way that you made for us so that we can walk in that way and receive what you intend us to receive. It is not your fault, God. And I don't know that so many people are not hearing that today. God, it's not your fault when suffering happens. You already made a way out of it. On one hand, it didn't have to happen, but if it does, we can believe you afterwards and fix it up in no time. I thank you so much, Lord, that you made a way for people to receive. You did fix everything. And it's not your fault, God. Lord, I know that you know that. But we should just tell you that from ourselves, Lord. Well, it's not your fault. Thank you for doing everything, Father. It's not your fault. Thank you for doing everything, Father. It's not your fault. You did everything, Lord. We just need to get to know it. Thank you, Lord. That's why people perish for lack of knowledge. The way has been made, and it's been accessible for all time. But if this perishing, it's not your fault, Lord. It's just lack of knowledge, but of course, lack of knowledge is easily remedied. We just get to know you, Lord, and you're willing to teach us. It's not your fault, Lord. We don't blame you, Lord, because we know the truth now. You've done everything, Lord, you can on your end, and you're inviting everyone in this whole world to receive it. The dead or the living, Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, that there's, there's hope. For the dead or the living, I think that there's hope, Lord, because you fix literally everything, including that death. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We want to portray you in an accurate light. That's all we want to do, Lord, is portray you in an accurate light. Father, we want to portray you in an accurate light to people. And Father, I pray that you would use what was said to, uh, to get that across to people. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for all your might, for all your authority. And thank you, Lord, that you're, you're all just. We thank you for who you are, Father. And we admire you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world.
If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.